We have our final guest before we turn it back over to the uh, on-stage presentation. That is Mr. Jim Watson, Senior Beverage Analyst at Rabobank. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. So, I mean, you are sort of, uh, I feel like, a little bit of a kindred spirit here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not that I am a senior beverage analyst, but you're sort of observing the whole space. You're watching trends and, and sort of market forces shape Absolutely. it. Um, so I'm going to start you with a really easy one. What are some of the current trends in the beverage space that are sort of uh, catching your eye and catching your interest as an analyst? Absolutely. So, so one of the things I fo categories I focus on a lot at Robobank is the coffee industry. And so what's been most interesting is how much coffee I see here today and how much uh, the coffee industry is becoming integrated into the broader soft drink industry. So it used to be that these are separate companies, completely separate supply chains. You go to a separate store, uh, like a coffee shop to buy that, whereas you'd go to a normal you know, convenience store to buy every other beverage, right? And so in the last five to 10 years, this is really changing. And this is partially, I think, the, the evolution of cold brew and ready to drink coffee. So now you've got, uh, you used to have Starbucks, and they had, not talking about the shops, the ready to drink. And so they were 80, 90% of the, the ready to drink market. But that was it. And so it wasn't a very vibrant market. And so now, kind of as, as cold brew came around as a new method of preparation and a new hook to get people into ready to drink coffee, you had this wave of new entrants into the market. And that really, um, and that really kind of, created a, a virtuous cycle in retail, right? So you've got new entrants, more shelf space coming, more consumers seeing it. And so that's bringing that soft drink and, and coffee industry together. I mean, that it would, uh, certainly we've observed that, you know, obviously a lot of cold brew brands launching. I mean, is that category, is there still room for growth there? Is there just, I mean, how saturated are we? Or how much room for, you know, how much more ceiling is there for RTD cold brew? I, I think there's so much more room. So what's interesting is, uh, you know, we hold up Japan as kind of like the, the crazy example. Now, their uh, ready to drink coffee represents about one in five, you know, dollars spent on on a bottled beverage, right? And that that's absurd compared to what we have got in the U.S. is about the second best market in the world, and we're still looking at broadly it's one percent of, of of dollars spent. Um, now, we're not expecting to get to anywhere near Japan levels. That's a vending based market. It's a different market, but these brands, what's interesting about them for a coffee segment is that they source from outside coffee. So you're talking about brands that are taking from energy drinks and, and really taking from cola. So you could also see coffee as a new energy drink, a new style of it, um, and they're all sourcing from, you know, the, basically the, the, the cola market. And I, I think what's, uh, what's, what's great about it is now you even see so many drinks that are combinations of um, like uh, energy drinks and coffee, right? Because the, the combination is so obvious that you see brands that want to do both at the same time. And Coke is even coming out with Coke Energy and Coke Plus Coffee in emerging markets. So it's becoming more explicit. Well, I mean, that's an interesting thing too. I mean, is there, is there more uh, potential or more legs? Or are you seeing more uh, growth for coffee as sort of a added value bonus to something like a Coca-Cola with coffee or a Java Monster, which is an energy drink with coffee added? Or is it, are, are there going to be more sort of uh, pure plays that like this is, you know, authentic, real, regular coffee? You know, I, I think there are plenty of coffee companies that are going to come in and they're going to start out with coffee as the base and then they may add things to it. And you're seeing a lot of that where like functional ingredients added to coffee. Uh, but, but I actually think that the flip side could be very interesting too because as Coke decides to add coffee to Coke, what they can do, and so they've talked about their Coke plus coffee, and I, I tried this when I was in Brazil last year, which is one of the first markets it was introduced in, and it, it's, a, it's a nice product and it works, the taste works surprisingly well, but when Coke can do it is they can introduce it in 50 markets around the world and get it widely distributed right away. So, you know, I think perhaps in the US you might see more coffee startups doing interesting things here. For other markets that don't have anything along these lines, Coke can create a category overnight um, and, and introduce this. And I think it is meant to do that. So this is meant to say, we're trying to, Coke is trying to move people to say like, hey, we want to 
develop an energy drink segment in a market that maybe doesn't have it. We want to develop coffee drinks in a market that doesn't have it yet. How do we do that? Well, we start out with Coke and then we move them a little bit closer to Coke plus coffee. Uh, and then we can move them somewhere else, even higher up the value chain. Well, you know, just because you brought up Coke, I think it's a great example with the the acquisition of Co uh, Costa Coffee mm -hmm. last year. I mean, we, initially it seemed like that was going to be a sort of an outside the U.S. type of play. But now, uh, recently, they've talked about introducing ready-to-drink products under that brand name. How do you think that that sort of, you know, in maybe six months to a year, how are we going to view that acquisition maybe differently than we do now? Or how do you think it's going to end up? So, so I think what's important to understand about that is that, you know, Costa is a platform for global coffee ambitions for them. So it's not a, a, a chain of stores and it's definitely not meant to just stay, you know, UK centric, Western Europe centric. Um, but they have a couple, so they're rolling out now a ready to drink product, right? So they said in home markets, we're going to do it in Q2. Um, you know, but I expect to see the vending machine platform, is, I think is one of the most important things out of the Costa portfolio. Coke doesn't want to expand coffee shops, but a coffee vending machine, the Costa Express, uh, you know, those are, they already had thousands around, uh, you know, the UK and Western Europe. That's a really powerful platform, right? So that's something Coke could right now take into the US and take into hospitals and universities and convenience stores and all these places where it would be hard for Coke to come up with a, a real coffee solution. But this is a ready-made coffee solution. So this is almost like a uh, tech uh, tech play in, in, in some I mean, ways? In, in, in a sense, right? Um, it's a way that they can access coffee with a, you know, kind of a proven technology that had been out in the market um, that they didn't have. And, uh, you know, that it could be, you know, I could see it as a plug and play kind of thing. Like they, they have a, a truck going to all these stops and now they put in this, uh, you know, a new coffee service and it's pretty... I say it's pretty easy to do. We'll see how well they do it, but uh, it's pretty easy to imagine how they could do it. Well, you know, we talked. A, uh, we're talking a lot about coffee, obviously, and getting back to sort of the the, the uh, crop itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what what is sort of the the state of the you know the price of coffee, and is it you know I, we, I've read a lot in recent times about sort of the uh, the struggle to make it a sustainable crop for uh, farmers to sort of you know have that financial incentive mm -hmm. to continue farming and to continue to supply the, the large demand that's being felt all over the world. I mean, are we sort of in a dangerous ground when it comes to the pricing of the coffee? Absolutely. So um, for those who don't follow, the, the coffee is traded on the New York, uh, New York uh, Intercontinental Exchange. It's called the C price. Uh, the price is really low. It's below a dollar right now. This is below the cost of production for uh, a number, like most countries production around the world. Uh, the issue is in Brazil with the devaluation of their own currency. Uh, they're making plenty of money. Um, so we don't necessarily see this price turning around. Uh, what it means in the market here is that it's easier for new competitors to get into coffee products. And that could be, you know, startups with RTDs that we would see, uh, you know, today in the coolers, or it could be somebody like, uh, you know, a quick service restaurant that wants to upgrade their coffee offerings and compete directly against a Starbucks. Now it's much cheaper for them to, to start to do that, and they could even do it in a more premium way. Even premium coffee is just created the differential to the base price. So if you have a cheap base price, you can have a great coffee offering. And, yeah. and it's still fairly affordable on, on the coffee side. Well, that's a great point because the, the demand is not only for more coffee, but it seems to be for more specialty coffee, more premium coffee. And Absolutely. Well. Great. Well, we're going to uh, keep things moving here. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really a great pleasure. Thank Jim, you. We'll see you around pleasure. next time. Absolutely.